Okay? So that's what the chair does. The chair is the interface with your consciousness. So when you understand that your consciousness is interfacing through the chair, that helps you get to a point in yourself where you can see that the chair is a psychic amplifier. That's what it does. The chair's function is that it takes your natural, innate psychic function and makes it vastly more powerful. Oh, the Philadelphia experiment uh, was uh, the result of the testing of high-energy arc welding on the creation of very large battleships by the U.S. Navy in World War II uh, surrounding Norfolk Naval Air Force Base, which I used to be right near in Virginia Beach. What they found was that when you got this, uh, this high energy, this was the highest arc welding ever done, like a big bolt of lightning. And it pinched time-space into space-time. So you get this black hole in the room. And then, actually, they were having tools disappear. So the tools never came back, and they realized there's something here we can use, and they actually designed it into something that they put on the ship in the hopes that the ship would be able to be invisible, like the tools became invisible. What they didn't realize is that they were going to jump from one place to another, and it had a devastating effect on the crew. Anyway, uh, I don't want to spend all of our time just going through this old material. So we're going to get back to the chair. We're going to get back to the point that they could actually create a wormhole with the chair, with the psychics exercising their consciousness in the chair. They had help from, apparently, ETs from Sirius in designing the chair. And the chair allowed them to send people through time. There were multiple wavelengths that the chair cranked out on graph paper. Okay? Some of those wavelengths were corresponding to a natural 20-year harmonic in the Earth's vibration. And that 20-year harmonic, as it turns out, if people were moving through time, which is one of the things they found they could do, is send people through time, this wave would tell you exactly where you were in time, depending on where up and down it was. So what they found that was so bizarre was that at December 21st, 2012, they could calculate it down to the day, that's how precise this was, that for some reason all the graphs, all the waves would go into a complete flat line. They no longer moved up and down like before. They went flat for like seven or eight seconds. So then they're asking the guys that went through these stargates and were traveling into the future, what happened to you? Every single time that somebody tried to hit 2012, they said the same thing. There was this thing they called the bump. It actually hits you like a bump. You actually feel like you've slammed into something. And as soon as it slams into you, you have the most incredible religious experience you can imagine. Cosmic consciousness. Your consciousness just blasts into this wonderful place where you have awareness of no space, no time. All knowledge is available to you. Ecstatic God consciousness. You could be the galaxy. You could be a subatomic particle. You can go everywhere and do everything, and there is no sense of it ever ending. So when it finally stops, you just can't even believe that you're back to who you were before. Like what happened to Jodie Foster? Exactly what happens to Jodie Foster in contact. So, is that, is that the moment of no time, then? that's the zero time, yeah. And Daniel doesn't agree with me on this, but I believe that 2012 is our zero time <laughs> reference. By the way, Daniel did say that the stargates are real, that there is one main stargate per planet, that they dug them up from ancient Atlantean technology, they actually buried it under the ice in Antarctica because they were concerned that something would come through that could damage human life. So that is real. Stargate SG-1, all those television shows of which there's ten seasons, the first and second year of Stargate SG-1 are remarkably loaded with real stuff. And there's even an episode of Stargate called Wormhole Extreme, and you remember that one? Where they're making a fake television show about a real Stargate program? It's like this inside, tongue-in-cheek joke. And everybody watching the show kind of knows, okay, they're telling us something here. There's something real behind all this stuff. Well, it's true. Why do they do that? Okay, that's a very good point. Um, the reason why they do that is that you hide the truth out in the open. So that if I go, go into this lecture and I'm telling you all this stuff, you can just say, oh, well, he's just, he's just into Stargate. You know, he's just watching television shows. But if, in fact, this was really cool. One time, um, I was sitting down with Daniel one day, 
and we're talking about the looking glass, and this has a little uh, orb that appears when you're looking at a particular place, and it's a ball of light. So they gave it this really weird name. They call it an outer band individuated teletracer. Okay? Outer band individuated teletracer. And they shortened it to the word OBIT. Outer band individuated teletracer, an OBIT, right? So then we're thinking, all right, this is what they always do, right? They hide this shit out in the open. Let's go Google outer band individuated teletracer and see if there's anything there. I couldn't believe it when we went on Google after he just told me this. He had no idea either. And boom, Outer Limits. There's an episode of The Outer Limits called Outer Band Individuated Teletracer. And it's all about this stuff. There was a show. He, he was actually really interested in me, too, because I seem to have some sort of psychic connection to, this, to these things. He says, he says to me one day, what do you think a TVG is? I said, time vector generator. How did you know that? You're right. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I did not go to Montauk. I've never sat in the chair. Somebody asked me that. Did you, were you in the chair? No, no, no. I was just very, very fortunate by some kind of crazy synchronicity to meet this guy. I wish he would go forward, but he doesn't want to. He did tell me, by the way, that they have found life on other planets. He said that the moon Io around Jupiter has little creatures crawling in the, in the rocks. He said that Mars once had a civilization that they've actually had astronauts on Mars, that they have a photograph that he saw of these astronauts waving with a big pyramid next to them. They actually have underground bases on Mars. There's a technology we've learned about from other witnesses now called a jump room, where you walk into the room, it's like an elevator, the doors close, <laughs> you suddenly feel really sick to your stomach, the doors open, and boom, you're on Mars, just like that. No time has elapsed. So these technologies already exist. And I would certainly like to have one. It would be a lot easier than taking an airplane flight. You can get over the stomach thing, I guess. So, you know, again, all, all gate travel is much better than using a, using a ship. It's a much pref preferable method um, than, than traveling by a spaceship uh, because you go a lot faster and you go a lot farther. And you can reverse engineer it by taking the seat out of the ship, which is what they're doing here. So, have these seats ever showed up in film so that they can hide it out in the open? <laughs> well, check this out. There's your seat. Now, this one doesn't actually have any consciousness interface, but some of the other ones do. Total recall. Jump rooms to Mars, civilization on Mars, underground city, pyramid at the end. And once again, you have a chair that has a strong effect on your consciousness. In Stargate SG-1, they have the chair of the ancients, and O'Neill sits in it, and it activates and, and amplifies his consciousness, which allows him to def defeat the evil fleet of the Gua'uld by shooting balls of light at them. Minority report. Here you have people sitting in chairs, floating in water, and they are psychic, and it is amplifying their psychic ability, which Tom Cruise is then able to manipulate on a screen. One of the things that Daniel told me is that out of all the waves that this chair cranks out from the ships, that it also includes visual images from your pineal gland. And they can space them out and look at them, just like in the movie. So this may have been designed to set the precedent so that someday they could actually create a department of pre-crime. Now, what also is very interesting is that the witness testimony we have of people going through these wormholes shows us that it looks like little light bulbs lined along the sides as you go inside. So that right there is not an accident. Really? Oh, how about that? Jim Mars has been talking about pre-crime in Britain, he said. Okay, X-Men is another one. You remember Cerebro, where he wheels up to this thing? This is actually the antenna at Montauk, except that it's an it's a octahedron, two Egyptian pyramids, base to base. But the same basic idea. There's a chair in there. You put this little helmet on. This is where you sit. And then it amplifies your psychic ability. That's what allows him to be able to find the missing mutants when they go missing. It's what allows them... Remember that one scene in, uh, in, in X-Men where um, one of the whole movies, actually, the plot is that there's an, e that there's an evil force that's going to harness his consciousness to get him to run the chair and basically kill everybody who's a mutant on the planet. 